Good afternoon, everyone. I'm calling to order the House Committee on Consumer Protection and Commerce. Uh, today is February 28th, 2 p.m. We are in Conference Room 329. Uh, today we have 17 uh, agenda items, so we'll be limiting uh, testimony to two minutes. Uh, for those who are on Zoom testifying, please mute yourself and turn your video off until you are called upon. If you are having issues, uh, you can use the chat function to message our IT staff to get it sorted out. And if we have time, we'll come back to you. Okay, first on the agenda, we have HB 797 relating to occupational licensure. First to testify, we have Lee Antishima, Executive Director from the Board of Public Accountancy in opposition. Good afternoon, thank you. Um, my name is Leanne Tashima. I'm with the um, Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs. I'm the Executive Officer for the Public Accountancy Board. We'll stand on our written testimony and I'll try to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Marilyn Newell, President of the Hawaii Association of Public Accountants in opposition. Hi. Um, the Hawaii Association of Public Accountants um, opposes HB 797 because of the unfair treatment to local CPA um, CPAs in Hawaii and this provides no notice and no fees for out-of-state and foreign uh, CPAs. So I, if you have any questions, um, please let me know. Thank you. Next we have Daryl Nita, individual testifying in support on Zoom. Not present. Okay, we'll be moving on to Ron Heller, individual testifying in support on Zoom. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Vice Chair, for the opportunity to testify. Uh, I'll try to keep this very brief. I just want to make a couple of quick points. Uh, first, on, on the no notice and no fees point, uh, this is similar to legislation that has been enacted in every other state and none of them have had any problems with it. In fact, some of the states that initially did this with sunset dates built into their law have come up on those sunset dates and have decided to renew this type of provision. So clearly, if, if it was causing problems, if it was disrupting business or hurting local CPAs, we would have seen other states either not choosing to do it or not choosing to renew it. But in fact, what we've seen is every other state not only enacting this, but those who have hit their sunset dates are renewing it and keeping it. Uh, second, I want to emphasize that what this really does is provide more choice for consumers, both individuals and businesses in the state of Hawaii, in terms of retaining the CPA expertise that they need. It gives them a nationwide pool, basically, of people they can hire and work with. And if we try to put restrictions on people from other states coming in to practice in Hawaii, we are also, by definition, putting restrictions on clients in Hawaii hiring those people. And so we really need to look at this from the viewpoint of the clients and make as much expertise as possible available to businesses and individuals in Hawaii. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other persons here to testify on this measure? Okay, members, we have written testimony in support from Island Plastic Bags, in support from CW Associates, opposition from Newell Roberts, CPAs, uh, in support from KPMG LLP, in support from e several testimonies in support from EY, and several, uh, nine individuals in support, as well as four, five individuals in opposition. Uh, members, are there any questions? Sure. Go ahead, Rep. Yeah, for, uh, see, the Board of Public Accountancy. So, um, have you folks received complaints by the public or by accounting firms that they're unable to secure 
uh, practitioners, accounting practitioners in specialized fields or? Um, I guess those kind of inquiries, um, I have not come across them, but I've only had the board since May of last year. Um, I can tell you that for an out-of-state CPA who wants to practice temporarily in this state can apply. There's a pathway for them to apply for a permit to practice as long as they can um, associate themselves with a local firm, a CPA firm. So there is a pathway for an out-of-state CPA to come here and practice temporarily, which appears that this bill would also re um, allow. But in, those, in our case, they would apply for, with an application. Um, in this case, there is no mention of an application to be filed. So it's hard to track those people. Okay, so you folks uh, approve applications for non-licensed accountants to practice in Hawaii? For, um, I believe it's 90 days or thir three months, yes. This one is for 120 days. Yeah, so. But no I'm, application. So, 90 days, 120 days. How did you set the 90 days? Um, that was just established. Um, for people who may specialize, like maybe, um, so for the national firms, for example, that are licensed in all, most of the states, and they wanna bring an expert from their other um, state to come and um, temporarily practice here, um, they can do so under this temporary permit. Um, How long does enough. that application process take? Um, it's just an application, there's no other, um, there, there's no CE requirement as long as they can affiliate themselves with a local firm. And the so local firm is held responsible yes. for whatever work that person does? Yes. As well as the individual because we do issue them a permit to practice. So it's something that we can, you know, if something goes wrong, if they violate the licensing laws for some reason, that is something that can be disciplined, yeah. Do you guys have jurisdiction? Yes. Over because that we individual? would be issuing the permit to practice. Because yes. you issue a permit to yes. that person. Yes. In this case, there's no permit, right. but the law states that you guys would have jurisdiction over that person. It says that, but we're not sure how that's gonna be enforced or monitored. Or even that that person practices is practicing in Hawaii. Correct. Okay, thank you. Members, any other questions? Actually, uh, I have a question. Um, so in the association's testimony, they noted that there was some concern regarding enforcement or th that it's impossible to attempt to sanction out-of-state foreign CPAs. Under the current temporary permit for CPAs, is there a way to sanction them, say, if they were to malpractice in some way? Um, yes, because we're issuing them like a permit. Um, in this case, we're not issuing any permits to these individuals. It's just they meet the requirements. They have, they have a privilege to practice. Um, they don't have to file an application with us, so we won't even know who's actually practicing here. Okay. As opposed to how the current pathway is that allows someone to come in, they apply, and we issue a permit to practice on a temporary basis, and then uh, do you have a number as to how many out-of-state uh, CPAs there are? CPAs? Or how, how many temporary permits you issued for out-of-state CPAs? That I don't have, okay. but I do have the numbers for the CPAs. Um, no, I'm just curious about the out-of-state CPAs. I know I just issued one since I've had the board since May of last year. Would you describe it as a frequent occurrence? No. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay, no other questions? Seeing none, we'll be moving on to the next item in the agenda, HB 846, HD 2. This is relating to teachers. First to testify, we have Mitzi Higa from the Hawaii State Teachers Association with comments. Aloha Laverne Moore speaking on behalf of Osa Tui Jr., President of the Hawaii State Teachers Association. We sup submitted comments on this um, we find that this bill has so many unanswered questions 
and basically our Hawaii State Teacher Standards Board does a very good job in licensing our teachers and if teachers want to teach in Hawaii they should meet our standards and we strongly support grow our own um, teachers so we would like that program better thank you thank you next we have Felicia <coughs> Villa Lobos from the Hawaii Teacher Standards Board in opposition Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, Committee members. My name is Felicia Villalobos. I'm the Executive Director for the Hawaii Teacher Standards Board. Submitted uh, testimony in opposition on behalf of the board. Uh, we'll stand on our testimony, and if you have any questions, happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Kelly Mae Douglas from the United States Department of Defense, Military, Community, and Family Policy and Support. Hi, Chair, uh, uh, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. Um, Kelly Mae Douglas with the U.S. Department of Defense in support of HB 846-HD2, and I stand on my testimony, happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Keith Hayashi from the Department of Education with comments. Okay, seeing no person from the DOE. Um, members, are, the, uh, are there any other, oh, sorry, I go ahead. <laughs> Uh, so my name is Kerry Tom from the Department of Education Office of Talent Management. Um, we uh, representing Keith Hayashi, superintendent, um, providing comments, uh, answer any questions, sending on our written testimony. Thank you. Are there any other persons here to testify on this measure? Okay, seeing none, members, we have a written testimony with comments from the Hawaii Association for Justice. Uh, members, are there any questions? Okay, seeing none, we'll be moving on to HB 1074. This is relating to Executive Office of Aging. First to testify on this measure, we have Caroline uh, Kadirao uh, from the Department of Health, Executive Office of Aging and Support. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. My name is Caroline Kadirao. I'm the Director of the Executive Office on Aging, and we stand in strong support of HB 1074 relating to the Executive Office on Aging. This measure is to clarify language currently in law for um, our Kapuna Care program that we blended last year with our Kapuna Caregiver program. So now it's one program under Kapuna Care and we're clarifying the definitions of caregiver support services, Kapuna Care services and respite <coughs> services. And we appreciate um, you hearing this bill and we stand in strong support. Thank you. Thank you. Next to testify we have Jamie Hsu, Acting Administrator from the Department of Consum Commerce and Consumer Affairs, Cable Television. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, no, we don't have any other testifiers on this measure. Uh, we, members, we have one written testimony from the Kapuna Caucus of the Democratic Party of Hawaii in support. Members, are there any questions? Actually, I do have a question for the Department of Health. So uh, under this new definition, according to this bill, how will that affect the Kupuna uh, caregivers or care program? What it will do, it will allow us to serve all caregivers, not just those that are employed. So when we did the merge of the two programs, it talked about the employed caregivers, but we do have caregivers that are retired, caring for a loved one, or just aren't working. So this would expand the program in a way because we would now not just be focusing on employed caregivers, but all caregivers. So I assume there's a financial impact? There isn't on for this. It's okay. just um, clarifying language as a housekeeping measure. There are other bills that um, have an appropriation for Kapuna Care. Thank you. Thank Enough you. No questions. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. OK, uh, members, we'll be moving on to the next bill, HB 371 HD1. This is uh, relating to telecommunications and cable industry information reporting. First to testify on this measure, we have Jamie Hsu from DCCA uh, Cable Television Department in support. Good afternoon, Vice Chair, members of the committee. The department stands on his written testimony and is available for any questions. Thank you. Next we have Bert Lung from the DBED in support. Aloha Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. My name is Bert Lum with the Hawaii Broadband and Digital Equity Office in DBED. DBED stands on this uh, written testimony in support of this bill and of course available for any questions uh, and thanks for allowing me to testify. Aloha. Thank you. Next we have Rebecca Lieberman from the Charter Communications uh, in support on Zoom. Present. Aloha Chair, Vice Chair and members of the committee. My name is Rebecca Lieberman. On behalf of Charter Communications, we, strand, we stand in strong support of this bill 
and are available for any questions. Mahalo. Next, we have Janine Suki from the Hawaii, Hawaiian Telecom uh, in support. Aloha Chair, Vice Chair and members. My name is Janine Suki. I'm here for um, Hawaiian Telecom. We are in strong support of this bill. Um, you may hear later from uh, my colleague at AARP who has concerns regarding um, 440J repeal. I just want to assure you that um, these issues are uh, they're not the same in terms of uh, the, the data that we are able to produce for the state in 440G. That's census level data. It's very, very um, broad and it's detailed in my testimony. The data that we are providing through the FCC maps, which um, started as of last year, is, is, is um, being updated and um, our experience in Hawaii is that, you know, the, as the maps are updated, we're seeing far more um, greater matches. We have turned to uh, working with the state, offered to work with other folks like the county of Hawaii, which are um, filing bulk and individual challenges as well. And I have opened dialogue with them so that if they have any questions regarding some of the service that we report on this map, we're able to dialogue and, and um, identify, pinpoint where th those areas are serviced and where there are gaps. And that's what I just offer you to consider um, as we stand on strong support for this bill. Available for any further questions as well. Thank you. Are there any other persons here to testify on this measure? Please go ahead. Aloha, Chair Nakashima, Vice Chair Sayama, and members of the committee. I'm Kelly E. Lopez, State Director for AARP Hawaii. I uh, hate to be the lone um, opposer of this leg uh, proposed legislation. Uh, with all due respect to the providers um, <clears throat> and the state, uh, we oppose this primarily because from AARP's perspective, uh, we understand clearly that broadband is regulated at the FCC federal level. However, the data is critical to the people here on the ground in Hawaii. And we want some assurance that there is a state agency that is paying attention and challenging those maps. Uh, as Janine indicated, uh, Honolulu County, I mean, not Honolulu, uh, um, Hawaii Island County uh, did um, provide some challenges. Uh, the concern is that there are th that the state agencies that should have some oversight, um, you know, we're not aware of their engagement. And the concern is that even though broadband is regulated at a federal level, in the end, it really is a public utility insofar as it's the only way that many people can gain access to services that are available. Now, of course, Congress at some point can debate uh, that, but I don't think the state should give up its uh, authority and its ability to um, have greater role in the data, in collecting the data and validating it. Our issue is trust but verify rather than relinquish authority. Um, again, we look forward to talking to the providers and the state uh, to perhaps better understand what they're thinking, but we have major concerns about the ability to have the state of Hawaii continue to have a role in um, understanding how the data is used and whether it's accurate. There are situations, not here in Hawaii so far, um, where Sorry, data- two minutes is- Okay, uh, yeah. uh, anyway, accuracy of data and transparency. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any, any other persons here to testify on this measure? Seeing none, members, we have written testimony and support from the Maui Chamber of Commerce as well as uh, the Cellular Telecommunications and Internet Association also in support. Members, are there any questions? Okay, seeing none, we'll be moving on to HB 1027HD1. Related, this is relating to Money Transmitters Modernization Act. Uh, first to testify on this measure, we have Iris Ikeda from the DCCA in support.
Aloha, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Iris Ikeda. I am the Commissioner for the Division of Financial Institutions, Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs. And this measure is actually um, just kind of finalizing the, moder the Model Act, the Model Money Transmitter Modernization Act. Well, that's hard to say. Um, but this is just the financial components. Um, that is the agreed upon language between um, the regulators and the industry. So I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other persons here to testify on this measure? Seeing none, uh, members, that's the only testimony we have. Are there any questions? Seeing none, we'll be moving on to HB 259. This is relating to consumer protection. Uh, first to testify on this measure, we have Sharon Hurd from the Hawaii Department of Agriculture and Support. Good afternoon, Chairperson, Vice Chair, members of the committee, Sharon Hurd, Department of Agriculture. Here to s testify in strong support of this bill with a comment that should this bill move forward, we would ask the respectfully ask for a position within the department to enforce the labeling and identification of the, the, the content using new science-based techniques that the industry has, all has tested and proven to be effective. Thank you. Thank you. And next to testify, we have Gerard Bastiens uh, from the Hawaii Coffee Company in opposition on Zoom. Aloha, Chair, uh, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. I'm Gerard Bastiens, President of the Hawaii Coffee Company, testifying in opposition to House Bill 259. Um, Act 222, SLH 2022, appropriated funds to the Hawaii Department of Agriculture to conduct an independent study to assess the economic impact of Hawaii's coffee, la coffee labeling laws on local coffee farmers and the local coffee industry. Uh, it is our understanding that Governor Green recently released those funds and the Department of Agriculture is in the process of completing an RFP uh, for this study, which is due to the legislature prior to the convening of the 2024 session. Uh, we believe it is prudent to wait to the study to be completed before taking any action. Um, additionally, the Hawaii Coffee Company offers a range of coffee from 10% Kona blend to 100% Kona coffee. Uh, all products are clearly labeled to reflect whether the coffee is a blend or 100% Kona coffee to ensure consumers are fully informed of the composition of the product. My written testimony outlines uh, more detail regarding the reasons why we believe it is important to offer consumers a range of products. For these reasons, I ask you to please hold the measure. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Next we have, sorry, uh, Suzanne Schreiner from the Lionsgate Farms and support on Zoom. Not here. Okay. Moving on, we'll go to Henry Curtis, Executive Director from the Life of Land in support. Aloha, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. Henry Curtis, Executive Director of Life of the Land. It's remarkable how long it takes to have truth in advertising for coffee. It's remarkable that we need studies and more studies and additional studies when we've known for years and decades that truth in advertising makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Bruce Corker from the Rancho Aloha Coffee Farm in support on Zoom. Good, af <clears throat> Good afternoon, Chair Nakashima and members of the committee. I am a coffee farmer in Hawaii County and I strongly support HB 259. I would like to make three points in support of this bill. Uh, first, the truth in labeling provisions in HB 259 will help protect consumers from deceptive labeling and fraud. Second, the bill will economically benefit Hawaii coffee growers and protect the reputation of Hawaii grown coffee. The third point is that as a state whose economy is heavily dependent on tourism, 
of what Hawaii should be concerned about protecting the reservoir of goodwill that it enjoys on the mainland and around the world. Failure of Hawaii to follow basic principles of truth and labeling undermines that reservoir of goodwill. Visiting consumers do not like to be misled and cheated by deceptive advertising and deceptive labeling. Please protect Hawaii's goodwill. Please pass HB 259. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Uh, are there any other persons here to testify on this measure? Okay, seeing none, members, we have written testimony in support from Kona Coffee Farmers Association, Hawaii's Thousands Friends, Kanalani Ohana Farms, Hawaii Farmers Union, United Co. Coffee Mill, Maui Farmers Union, KCFA, Cassandra Farms, Ka Ohana O Na Pua, and 19 other individuals in support. Members, are there any questions? Sure. Oh, please go ahead. Yeah. Um Department of Ag. Representative Onishi. Yeah, um, you heard the study being mentioned. So is it true that the governor has released the money and you guys are going out for an RFP? The uh, Kona Coffee Farmers Association meeting on Friday, that was the, the, uh, was the testimony, but let me look back, release the money? The money is released and the RFP is being done. Okay, what's the timetable for the study to be started? Well, that's a good question. The RFP has to be posted for 30 days. So let's say, even if we posted it today, I would say we'd be ready for the report at the start of the next session. Okay, okay. So you will make the deadline. Well, to release the funds, uh, the, the funds will lapse, as I understand, at the end of June. So we will have it uh, done by the end of June so the funds don't lapse and then we do the study and we should have the report to you by this beginning of the next session. Yeah, okay. 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 And then, uh, Chair, if I might, Mr. Curtis. So he testified about truth and labeling. So what are you referring to? For decades, companies that use partial amounts of Hawaiian coffee in label them as Hawaiian coffee. And that has um, been deceptive. Um, and there have been a number of studies that show that truth in labeling makes sense. So if I understand correctly, the labeling requires what percentage of Hawaiian coffee is included in the product? I would defer to others on that. Well, you're testifying that there's not truth in labeling. I'm testifying, yes. But you don't know that there is a percentage? I don't have that information on me at the moment. Okay. Chair, if I might ask the department to come back up. Senator, the, uh, currently the truth in labeling for that particular question is applies only to Kona Coffee and it is 10%. So none of the other uh, regional coffee brands require uh, the percentage labeling? I will defer to Richard Cohen. Uh, as of now, there's no other um, geographic um, labeling requirements and there's no percentage that's required for other, other, than, other than Kona coffee, which okay. is 10%. Okay. Okay, thank okay. you. Um, Representative, may I add to my previous question, response that the $100,000 that was appropriated for the study was restricted by 10%, and so we really have a $90,000 RFP going out. Okay, so okay. is that gonna pose a problem? No, no, it's just I wanted okay. to clarify that you know, it's not the full amount. Okay. That the release was for the 100,000 restricted to 90. Okay? okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay, members, are there, please go ahead, Rep. Lowen. Thank you. Um, Henry Curtis, <laughs> why not? 
Um, regardless of whether the letter of the law is followed in labeling, I think part of the case that's being made in the purpose clause of the bill is that the marketing is deceptive nonetheless to use the name Kona on a product that doesn't reflect that in any way in the flavor or quality of, of what's actually being sold, which is one bean in 10, not detectable. So, um, you know, regardless of the truth and labeling issue, do you think there's other ways for marketing to be deceptive, even if they're following the letter of the law in labeling? I think it would benefit, um, it would be beneficial if products that are labeled Hawaiian are actually based in Hawaii rather than um, using the name Hawaii to cover various kinds of imported materials. Yeah. Um, okay, thanks. I'm going to a quick question for Department of Ag. Okay. Department of Agriculture. Oh. Hi. Um, Representative we've had bills this session for different kinds of labeling of different kinds of products, um, all kind of making the case that being marketed as Hawa being from Hawaii or mm -hmm. from a certain region mm -hmm. without actually the product being sold being from that region is undercutting our, our local farmers. Do you think that all Hawaii's farmers deserve the kind of same fair treatment under the law? Is there a reason we should single out coffee specifically? All farmers deserve the same type of respect. However, the coffee industry is trying to protect their brand being they feel that when you want dilute the, the coffee, it doesn't taste as good as 100%. I don't think some of the other farmers feel the same way. Um, this particular product is uh, world renowned. It pays a lot of money for cupping and the status that they have. Um, I think macadamia nuts, uh, to your point, uh, you know, even mamaki tea, hemp. Mm -hmm. So it, the, the, the brand is, is important, but coffee is in particular something they've built up for so many years that right. they're trying to protect. So because of the specific like boutique nature of Kona coffee and yes. it's, uh, the recognition of it as being something special, we should particularly protect that. that Especially name. at the farmer level, yeah. yes. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, and I, as I understand the, the, um, the, the study bill from last session did include looking at kind of different percentages. This bill proposes 51%, so only a majority, which is a compromise position in my opinion. But the study goes all the way to look at the economic impacts of, of going further, I think. Do you know what the percentage is? No, I, I'd get back to you on that one. Okay. Okay. All right, thanks. Okay, any further questions, members? Okay, seeing none, we'll be moving on to HB 1340 HD1. This is relating to mental health. First to testify on this measure, we have Tia Hartsock, Executive Director of <coughs> Office of Wellness and Resilience, in support. Uh, just standing on my testimony, thank you. Thank you, next we have Benjamin Lilybridge, uh, Malama Mushrooms in support on Zoom. Hello, everybody. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Please go ahead. Check, check. Can you yes. hear me? Please go ahead. Um, someone put up a thumbs up, a thumbs down. Can you hear me? Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll keep this brief um, and let the clinicians and scientists experts speak more to that aspect of psilocybin but uh, in short I, I grew up with a history of anxiety depression and substance abuse and in my early 20s experienced uh, psilocybin and from that point on have had very little to none of these um, mental disorders if you will and uh, so much so that it changed my life I started a mushroom company we and uh, and trying to share the gift of mushrooms with the world. However, we we don't sell uh, illicit mushrooms, just uh, legal superfood ones. But all to say is that this would greatly impact Hawaii, as there is many cases of alcoholism, um, meth issues, and other drugs, which are thus propagating domestic violence and another whole host of other um, 
issues in our state that with, I think, controlled psilocybin and other plant um, medicines in a clinical setting could greatly impact all sorts of our society here. So that's it for me. Thank you so much for listening and considering this. Thank you. Next to testify, we have Kathy Southard from the Hawaii Psychological Association in support. Hello. Aloha, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. My name is Kathy Southard. I'm a clinical social worker here in Hawaii. I'm representing the Hawaii Psychological Association. Um, I'm a former um, member of a Harvard Medical School psychiatry department and a former uh, Queens Medical Center social worker. Um, I first became interested in the use of uh, psychedelics in psychiatry while working at Harvard um, with a colleague who um, uh, convened a conference with Rick Doblin, who is the head of MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies, um, to um, teach all of us about psychedelics in psychiatry. Since then, I've become a MAPS trainee therapist. Uh, hopefully, in the future, as these technologies become available and legal, I'm going to hopefully will be one of the first practitioners, um, first therapists working with these medicines. Um, uh, so to help people heal from PTSD, treatment resistant, resistant depression, anxiety. Um, I have over 20 years experience as a clinical social worker in psychiatry and seeing these new developments um, that are transforming psychiatry. I know they're transformative and they lead to lasting healing that traditional SSRIs are just not able to accomplish. Uh, many research institutions right now are publishing scientific evidence of the efficacy and benefits of psychedelic medicines on the brain and the body. The FDA calls uh, psychedelic psilocybin a breakthrough therapy for severe depression. Many institutions, including Johns Hopkins, Yale, Harvard, NYU, publishing much research demonstrating the efficacy of these medicines to treat depression and anxiety. I hope the state of Hawaii would agree and allow a working group to look into these medicines. Thank you so much. Aloha. Thank you. Next we have Thomas Cook from Beyond Mental Health and Support. Thank you. I'm a board certified psychiatrist in private practice in Honolulu. I'm going to run through just a few safety issues in perten pertinence to psychedelics. Real briefly, suicide, criminality, road safety, and addiction. First, for suicide, uh, just compare with standard antidepressant treatment, which 17% of the population is now on SSRIs. They do increase the risk of suicide in the first month that they're taken. There's a black box warning for that. They increase risk of glaucoma, fetal birth defect, cleft palate, and thinning of the blood in the elderly. Don't want thin blood if you're going to have a fall, you have a brain bleed. Con contrast that with psilocybin, which has none of those adverse effects at all, and lower suicide risk significantly. It's the, one of the only substances that, that we know does. Um, now on with criminality. Um, almost all mass shooters have SSRIs in their bloodstream uh, when they are uh, tested later. Um, and we have 17% of the population on them and the percent's growing. Psilocybin has been looked at in terms of criminality risk at Johns Hopkins, Roland Griffiths, PhD, neuroscientist at Johns Hopkins. And uh, psilocybin lowers criminality risk when they do equal comparisons with, with other people. Now on road safety, we, all, we already have a lot of people driving at the stoplight next to you on oxycodone and Ambien and all kinds of sedatives, benzos, Xanax, and they do have very real road risks because they're taken every day. Whereas psychedelics are not, they're taken just once in a blue moon typically. You can get lasting relief from symptoms taken every month or every other month or even twice a year in some, some cases. And they're taken really in a ceremonial setting. They're not taken on people taking them on their own. They're taken with the involvement of clinicians. Now finally, addiction. Uh, we have numerous addicting pharmaceuticals. That's already very well known. But psychedelics, many of them have anti-addictive properties. There's the first federally funded study on psilocybin is looking at smoking cessation. And that's right now going on at Johns Hopkins. My and apologies. Uh, your two minutes is up. Can you please summarize? Of course. You. Uh, you can just ask me a question later. I was just going to say psychedelics lower addiction risk in general. That's all. You, I'm open for questions later. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Ashley Lukens from the Clarity Project in support.
Aloha, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. My name is Ashley Lukens, and I'm here on behalf of the Clarity Project. And I just wanted to share that at 36 years old, I was diagnosed with brain cancer and had the opportunity to experience psychedelics in a clinical setting and saw a, a very um, powerful transformation of my relationship to my diagnosis, which I think played an integral role in my healing. Not a week goes by now that I don't get reached out by a friend or a friend's friend or their parents or their auntie also navigating a cancer diagnosis. And unlike myself who was willing to access these medicines through the black market, these older people aren't willing to do that. They want to see it administered in a clinician's office here in Hawaii. And that's what this bill is about. It's about starting the regulatory framework process to allow clinicians to provide these psychedelics in a clinical setting so that everyone, like myself, can recover a sense of hope in the face of a terminal diagnosis. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Next we have Alexandra Takayesu uh, in support on Zoom. Okay, moving on. Uh, we have Robin Martin, individual in support on Zoom. Aloha, um, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Dr. Robin Martin. I'm a psychiatrist who trained and now practices in Honolulu. Uh, and I'm also assistant clinical faculty at the Department of Psychiatry at UH. Uh, and I'm in strong support of HB 1340, which will establish the Beneficial Treatment Advisory Council. <coughs> In my profession, I'm on the front lines of addressing the mental health crisis, but you do not need to look far to appreciate the, um, the impacts uh, of this crisis we face. Um, depression is the leading cause of disability worldwide, and suicide is the leading cause of death in the youth of Hawaii. Meanwhile, uh, PTSD is estimated to impact 5% of the population, with women and veterans particularly impacted. And let's face it, current standard of care is often ineffective for these folks, leaving many to suffer for years, if not for their lifetimes. Uh, MDMA-assisted psychotherapy has shown a two-thirds cure rate in two large phase clinical trials, a significant improvement over existing therapies. Psilocybin-assisted therapy is one of the most promising new treatments for depression in a generation, and as, uh, as demonstrated in several phase two clinical trials. Uh, this bill is an important step forward in evaluating how these treatments could be safely used for those who need it most in the state of Hawaii. Uh, I'm currently undergoing specialized fellowship training in these treatments in anticipation of FDA uh, approval, uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions from the committee. Uh, mahalo for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Next we have Christina Raddick from uh, Individual in Support. Alianzu. Uh, moving on, uh, we have John Williamson, individual in support. I stand on my written testimony. I'd just like to thank uh, Chair Marcuccino, Vice Chair Sayama, and the committee for considering this picture. Thank you. Next, we have A. Blaine Williams, MD, uh, individual in support. Aloha, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. My name is Blaine Williams. I am a board certified emergency doctor practicing here in Honolulu. I also have additional expertise in education related to psychedelic medicine and psychedelic assisted therapies. I would like to testify in strong support of House Bill 1340 to establish the Beneficial Treatments Advisory Council. Um, I see people suffering from uh, existential suffering related to um, uh, terminal illnesses, as well as anxiety, depression, and addiction um, in the emergency department. Uh, all day, every day. Um, it's depressing, honestly. And we know that psilocybin and related medicines have uh, incredible potential to help people heal emotionally, psychologically, uh, spiritually um, in their final days and also just uh, throughout their life. And these are incredibly safe. It's essentially impossible to overdose from psilocybin. You can't die. It's non-toxic. Um, and when administered therapeutically and ceremonially, it is um, incredibly safe um, and has minimal um, potential downfall. So please uh, support this bill. I'm available for any additional questions. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Apelusa, individual in support on Zoom. Okay. Are there any other persons here to testify on this measure? Please go ahead. 
Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, uh, Lauren Kim, Department of Health Planning and Policy Officer. Uh, the department offered comments, uh, substantive amendments actually, that redirects the uh, direction, the trajectory of this bill, from one focusing on psilocybin um, and potentially MDA, who are basically on track for US um, FDA approval, um, to a uh, as needed temporary uh, advisory council for FDA breakthrough therapy designations when mental health and substance abuse drugs are involved. Um, the department's involvement in any community planning on the implementation of psilocybin into our community will add very little. Uh, the Hawaii Psychiatric Medical Association, the Hawaii Medical Association are just as equally or better suited to put, put together a working group to come up with community standards of practice. Um, we only wish that uh, more people in the state would listen to the Department of Health, but again, we don't have that much leverage over the physician community uh, as they manage their own standards of practice and community standards of practice. But we do think that there is a strategic opportunity to keep our eye on FDA breakthrough designations in the future, especially as it, um, especially those drugs intended for mental health and substance abuse. Um, in this case, psilocybin received breakthrough therapy designation in 2018, so it's been about five or so, five, six years. Um, and again, it's, it's around the corner, probably next year. Uh, by the time this gets enacted and we um, pull something together, uh, I don't think it's going to make a meaningful difference anyway. Um, but for future FDA breakthrough therapy designations, it, the department is willing to pull together a little hooey to come together and think about, how, think forward about how we can implement this should the FDA give it full approval. Uh, and uh, we've submitted some very rough amendments that probably need some review from um, uh, drafting agencies. Um, but we think that would be a more enduring public policy good than a point in time uh, focus group, uh, a point in time working group on psilocybin. Uh, thank you, and I'll be available for questions. Thank you. Are there any other persons here to testify on this measure? Seeing none members, other questions? Please go ahead. Well, this question is for the health department. Yeah, thank you so much for coming. Um, with this hui, if it came together, um, could it also be solved in the private sector? I think so. Um, like I said, uh, there, I don't. I, I know the department well. I know our statute. I don't really see what we add to the process. There is nothing, no endorsement from the Department of Health that would embellish approval from the Food and Drug Administration. That's the gold standard for safety. We do not do our own research, primary research. Uh, we don't do randomized controlled studies. We would read other studies and maybe have a conversation, but that can happen with the private sector or a bunch of dedicated individuals. Um, but in the long term, as we want to take advantage of this immediate focus on mental health, we can see how uh, future conversations on breakthrough therapy designation um, could, could uh, benefit from some uh, guidance from the department, some, from the, conve the, the power to convene from the Department of Health. Thank you. Yeah. Members, any other questions? Please go ahead. Uh, for Office of Wellness and Resilience. Aloha. Thank you for being here and for your testimony. Um, I understand from your testimony that you might be willing to um, convene this working group within the Office of Wellness? That's if, if that's, yes. That would need an amendment though, right? Yes. Okay, thank you. Rather than within the DOH. Okay, any other questions? Seeing none, sorry members, I forgot to mention we also have 22 other written testimonies in support. Uh, okay, noting that, we'll be moving on to HB 714 HD1. This is uh, relating to mooring lines. First to testify, we have Ed Sniffen, Director, State Department of Transportation, with comments on Zoom. Aloha, I'm Dre Kalili. I'm the Deputy Director for Harbors. We submitted written comments. Um, basically, what, we're, what we convey in our comments is that if this is about regulation of labor, this, uh, this amendment to the statute should be included in a labor chapter rather than a harbors facility chapter. And if uh, the committee is inclined to move the measure along, we would ask that you consider the language that's been adopted in SB 823, which is a Senate companion, because um, it covers both the labor and the facilities uh, regulation and available for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Eric Wright uh, with the PAR Hawaii in opposition. 
Aloha, Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to testify in this bill. Um, my name is Eric Wright. I'm president of PAR Hawaii. We're the main fuel manufacturer in Hawaii. We uh, run a refinery out in Campbell Industrial Park and run a barge to the neighbor islands. Um, this bill would require us to use stevedore companies to tie up our barge that takes fuel to the neighbor islands. Uh, we're very concerned about that requirement. Um, frankly, we were really confused and surprised when we saw this bill. We, we don't really understand where it's coming from. We've been operating our barge, our fuel barge to the neighbor islands for literally decades without any issues uh, tying up the lines. And the, the guys that tie up our barge are actually union guys. So don't really get where the bill's coming from. Um, our barge loads fuel every three days or so in Barbers Point and then goes to Maui, Big Island, Hawaii every five to ten days. Um, schedule changes a lot. The weather changes, delays the barge. Uh, if we have to use stevedore services, that could potentially create major scheduling issues for us and potentially lead to fuel shortages on the neighbor islands. Um, additionally, we'd have, we have to pay for the stevedore services and so would everybody else running barges. And that's going to raise energy prices on the neighbor islands. So we don't think this is good policy. Um, there's a number of other companies that will be impacted, Hawaiian Electrics Operations, Hawaii Gas, um, Hawaiian Cement, Aloha Petroleum, a number of companies. So this bill has far-ranging impacts, and uh, we would urge you to defer it. And if you do uh, decide to move it, we would ask you to exempt uh, fuel products. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Next, we have Bob Hood, the Vice President from Aloha Petroleum, LLC, in opposition on Zoom. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. I'm Bob Hood, Vice President of Aloha Petroleum, LLC. In addition to my written testimony of opposition, I want to emphasize that our neighbor island fuel barging system is highly demanding and there is little to no flexibility in our scheduling. As such, I am and we are particularly concerned as this bill would not only lead to higher costs to consumers, but also scheduling delays resulting in the risk of fuel runouts on the neighbor islands. We urge deferral of this bill, and I stand on my written testimony. Thank you for the opportunity to provide further emphasis to my testimony. Thank you. Are there any other persons here to testify on this measure? Hey, members, we have written testimony in opposition from the Island Plastics Bags Incorporated, uh, Centerline Logistics, Island Energy Services. We have written testimony in support from IBU Hawaii Region, Hawaii Ports Maritime Council. Hawaii State AFL-CIO, ILWU Local 142, and ILWU Hawaii Longshore Division, and about 670 written testimonies in support from individuals. Uh, members, are there any questions? Please go ahead. Is DOT here? Anybody from DOT? Yes. Yes, hi. Thank you so much for um, being here and for your testimony. I was just wondering, as the agency that um, regulates the facilities involved, have there been any issues with non-stevedore mooring boat lines? Have so not, not that I'm aware of, but the regulation of non-stevedore versus stevedore labor on the facility, it falls outside our purview. So I just schedule which vessels can use which facility at which time without regard to what labor performs what work in the facility. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. So you might not actually be tracking this information, and I don't know if there's anybody better I could ask, but I'm just trying to get an idea for how many boats are currently being moored per day with the assistance of stevedores versus without. So um, I don't want to misspeak because there are some testifiers who you've heard from in the room who operate vessels at our facilities who use unionized labor that may not be stevedore labor. So I certainly want to speak for them, but I can certainly um, follow up with you with specific data on how many vessels come into our facilities daily. Um, but it would take some time to research whether they're manned, like the lines are manned, um, you know, by what unionized labor or what stevedore and company. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so please uh, send that information uh, to the chair of the committee and uh, we'll distribute that out to the members. If I sure may, thing. I have one more question for the stevedores. Oh, please go ahead. Are the stevedores available? I don't think they were present on the testimony, but. Oh, okay. Thank okay. You. 
Members, are there any other questions? Oh, please go ahead. This question is for um, anybody who testified in opposition. A volunteer? From your understanding, would this bill favor one company over another? Um, or one product over another? I believe the bill requires um, Hawaii-based stevedore companies, so that would be one, one area where it would differentiate. Are you a mainland company? Uh, we are not. Well, we, well, we're owned by a Houston-based company. We have local management here in Hawaii. Um, we charter our barge. The, the company that operates the barge is actually called South Brothers. They also filed testimony opposing the bill. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can I have a volunteer um, giving testimony in favor of it? Can I ask them a question? Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, members, any further questions? Seeing none, we'll be moving on to HB 575 HD 1 relating to gasoline power leaf blowers. First to testify on this measure, we have Ed Sniffen, Director for the State Department of Transportation and Support. Uh, we stand on our testimony in support Thank and you. available for questions. Thank you. Next, we have Lyle uh, Leonard from the Deputy Attorney General's Office uh, with comments on Zoom. Uh, good afternoon, oh, uh, Chair, uh, members of the committee. Uh, Lyle Leonard, Deputy Attorney General. Uh, the department's identified a um, preemption issue, preemption with federal law, and I'm available for questions. Thank you. Next, we have Kurt Otoguro from the Department of Education with comments. Good afternoon, Chair Nakashima, Vice Chair Sayama, Randy Tanaka, Department of Education Operations. Uh, we stand by our written testimony with some comments, and thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. Hello. Thank you. Next, we have Brian Lynch from the Honolulu Police in opposition on Zoom. Yeah. Uh, good morning, Chair and Vice Chair and Committee. Um, I'm Brian Lynch, Major of District 7, Honolulu Police Department. Um, we oppose House Bill 575 relating to gas saline powered leaf blowers, and we stand on our written testimony, and I'm available for questions if need be. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Ted Bolin uh, in support. We're seeing that he's not here. Here will be uh, okay. No, that's all the testifiers we have so far. I need a person here to testify on this measure. Seeing none, members, we have a uh, written testimony opposition from the Department of Facilities Maintenance, from the Department of Parks and Recreation, and Outdoor Power Equipment Institute. We also have written testimony and support from three individuals and one individual in opposition. Members, are there any questions? Oh, please go ahead. Attorney General. Thank you for flagging this potential supremacy clause issue. Um, mm -hmm. Have any other states, to your knowledge, banned gas powered leaf blowers? Uh, the states that are uh, like California are um, have a different standard. They're able to apply for a waiver of the um, preemption. Uh, that's that's a part of the, um, the statute itself. And, um, certain states are eligible to adopt California standards. Um, unfortunately, Hawaii is not one of those states. Why is that? Uh, it, it has to do with the fact that uh, Hawaii is uh, meets an air quality standard called attainment. <coughs> called a what? And, Sorry, what did you say? Uh, it has to do with the fact that Hawaii meets an air quality standard known as attainment. and. Um, and we don't have what's called a, par a plan under Part D that's specifically required under the statute. Um, so due to that fact, we, we are not eligible to um, adopt California standards. Okay. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Any other questions? Okay, seeing none, we'll be moving on to HB 704 HD 1 relating to motor vehicle registration.
Okay. Uh, okay. So no one to testify on this measure here. Uh, members, we have a lot of testimony and support. Um, seeing that there's no questions to be asked, we'll be moving on then to HB 378 relating to controlled substances. Uh, first to testify on this measure, we have Keith Hayashi, Superintendent from the Department of Education and Support. Good afternoon, uh, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee, Kurt Otoguro, Deputy Superintendent, testing on behalf of uh, Superintendent Hayashi. The department stands in on its written testimony in support of this uh, measure. Um, just wanted to comment that really we, we need more clinics. Uh, we just feel that if the committee would consider having the distance of those clinics a little farther away from the schools, uh, that w we feel that that would be prudent for the safety of our schools and our students. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Kenneth Fink from the uh, Hawaii State Department of Health uh, with comments. Seeing no one's here, we'll be moving on to Jared Rudula, uh, Department of Public Safety with comments. Uh, good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. My name is Jared Rudula. I'm the Narcotics Enforcement Administrator. Um, the Department of Public Safety is offering our comments. Um, we continue to have uh, issue and take some opposition uh, w with this bill. We're concerned, um, as we were in our previous testimony before the Health Committee, that this bill would have very, very far reaching and p potentially devastating effects if, if implemented um, in our uh, drug treatment um, community um, against both uh, the participants in the drug treatment community as well as businesses. That said, we are supportive of this measure's um, proposal to engage in a working group to open communication between schools and the treatment community. We think that if we can engage in, in positive communication that perhaps we can avoid some of the kinds of issues that have been reportedly occurring. Um, we'd also like to um, encourage that some alternative, uh, a, a, an alternative approach to looking at this, and that is, generally speaking, the controlled substances laws end when a patient gets their medication, and in this case, when a patient goes to a methadone clinic and gets their medication, that's where the controlled substance regulation ends. We would um, encourage a look at potential legislation similar to the County Liquor Commission's where the Liquor Commission, impo um, the law imposes upon a bar licensee a responsibility to timely prevent quarrelsome, nuisance, illegal behavior upon their customers and patrons. We think that uh, an approach similar to that where my office would have authority um, over my registrants to, to say you must control quarrelsome um, and, and nuisance type behavior amongst your customers and your patrons um, would, would be a, an approach that might also work here. So thank you very much. Thank you. Next we have Louis Kertesh, a Hawaii Disabilities Rights Center with comments. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair. Uh, I see several new members of the legislature that I haven't met, so let me just introduce myself. I'm Lou Bordeshek. I am the executive director of the Hawaii Disability Rights Center. Uh, Rep Tam, I know he's my representative, and I've known Representative Bilotti for a long time. Uh, anyway, uh, I have great respect for the difficulty of the policy issue that, that this presents in terms of community concerns. I didn't testify on the bill the first time around at the Health Committee because I generally like to be sure of my opinion before I give it. Uh, but I always had a lot of questions, and so I, uh, me and my office did some research, and uh, I'm more and more convinced that the bill is drafted in terms of the uh, singling out this clinic is going to violate the ADA, because there, there's little doubt that the people who go to these clinics are considered people with disabilities under, under the DOJ guidance. And what this bill does is it singles out these kinds of clinics. And I cited in my testimony, and I brought com some copies of an article in a journal from years ago that cited a Third Circuit uh, case and a Ninth Circuit case, which specifically held that you cannot single out certain kinds of clinics uh, and impose a requirement of X number of feet from a school 
if you wanted to, and I'm not saying that you do, but in theory I suppose you could say no clinics can be located within 750 feet of a school, but that's going to present all sorts of policy issues with lots of unintended consequences, undoubtedly. So uh, it's, that's our opinion is that the, the, this provision is, is going to be subject to legal challenge. I always like to say that I'm only one lawyer and this is my opinion, and so if you don't want to take my word for it, my advice would be uh, get an opinion from the Attorney General or, or ask somebody from the Legislative Reference Bureau and see what they think. Be, but my opinion is that the bill is, is drafted is clearly going to run afoul of the ADA. So thank you. Thank you. Next we have Alan Johnson from the Hawaii Substance Abuse Coalition in opposition. Hello, Chair, Vice Chair, and uh, members. I'm Alan Johnson, the Hawaii Substance Abuse Coalition. Uh, this bill is really about Champ's Methadone Clinic being near a middle school, and they've been there for 28 years together. But now there's a problem, and uh, we feel that the group meeting is a good idea to address this issue and to, uh, to single out individuals who are causing these problems and hold them accountable. That's a proper way to do something that's been there for 28 years. Uh, as for, for uh, this bill, it has morphed into violations of ADA rights, and they're vi violating the rights of people in recovery. The, the Supreme Court has ruled, the federal courts have upheld, including one case that said you, you can't say, ask them to move if they're near a school that's not allowed, they would prevail in federal court. And this is going to end badly because we're going to end up in federal court and then we're going to say that Hawaii is the last state, because other states have already lost, this is, Hawaii is the last state who discriminated against a class of people, the people in recovery. The community is going to be the punishers and healers, they'll be divided. Us providers are going to damage our relationship with the state and the hundred and some, the 150,000 people in recovery right now, they're going to prevail, but they're going to be as that and well with the 100,000 of people we're coming, we're going to say, we're going to remain hidden because we do discriminate. When this is really about individuals misbehaving and the law is clear, and they haven't met. So let's start with that. Let's start with the, the school and the Champs Clinic coming together. And all, one last comment is to say, we've added substance abuse clinics here, and that's kind of way out there. That's about Suboxone and Naloxone. That's about health clinics. That's about pain management clinics. You've now included them in there by adding substance abuse in there. And that is a broadening of this discrimination. And that would be even greater impact to all our health clinics. Uh, thank you. For thank you. Next to testify, we have Nikos Lavernes, uh, Grants and Advancement Manager for the Hawaii Health Harm Reduction Center in opposition on Zoom. Yes, uh, thank you. I'm not Nikos, but I'm Heather with the Hawaii Health and Harm Reduction Center. So thank you, Chair Nakashima and Vice Chair Sayama. Um, like uh, Director Radula, we are very concerned about this measure um, and do oppose it. Um, as you may know, just recently, because of the opioid crisis here and on the continent, the federal government actually just relaxed policies around particularly buprenorphine or suboxone to make it easier for people to prescribe and offer treatment for opioid use disorder, whereas this bill would make it even more challenging. Um, and as you've heard, we only have two methadone clinics in the state and only really a few dozen uh, buprenorphine programs that are actively taking patients. Um, additionally, um, as was mentioned by Lou, we do believe this runs afoul of the ADA and are worried, like uh, Alan Johnson, that this has far-reaching unintended consequences. Um, listen, we all want to keep children safe, and in general, I very much support a public health, public safety response, but really do hope that you consider making this a working group so we can look at this issue given that it is one specific clinic. Uh, so for example, my program does do Suboxone, and this could impact where we're currently located or our ability to take treatment into the streets with our street medicine program that we're trying to do. So thank you again for considering these concerns um, and really appreciate the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Uh, next, we have April uh, Simon uh, from Champs Clinic uh, in opposition. Hi. Um, so I'm representing both myself as an individual, also Champ Clinic as an employee there, I'm an addictions counselor, um, and also our nearly 300, I think it's about 275 or so uh, clients of the clinic. Um, 200 of which have approached me individually and offered to come today. I um, politely declined, thinking that 
it would turn into more of a circus, although I do think it would be valuable for, for them to become less of a statistic, less talked about in theory, and more looked at as the individuals that they are, the people in recovery who are being discriminated against in this bill. People in recovery are actively pursuing a lifestyle outside of drugs. Our people, for the most part, are doing everything that they can to move forward with their lives, to get away from um, various drugs, but obviously methadone is opiates. Um, the, the, the ADA protects the rights of people in recovery, and, um, and, and we know that our people are doing the right thing because we test them frequently. They're subjected to random urine analysis that shows both the presence of methadone, so they're not diverting it into the community, they're not selling it to some middle school students, <laughs> they're actually taking their medicine as they're supposed to. Our nurse watches them take it. They do have take-homes if they achieve the, the goal points that they have in their um, treatment program. And that also we test for the other drugs, any other drugs or alcohol, and the metabolites. So we can see if they've taken it recently or over time. So it's not like they can take it and they know that, well, after three days it's out of my system and I can go. That's not the case. We can test them. It, it shows over time. So our people are doing what they need to do. Many of our people have kids. I have kids. Um, this is not about protecting children. This is about discriminating against people who are seeking a better life. My Everyone apologies. wants to protect uh, children. Your two minutes are up. Can you please summarize? Yeah. Thank you. Um, basically, what we're saying is we're open to a, a discussion. We have often approached the school. What is the concern? Who are the individuals concerned? Are they our people at all? Because this is the community is what it is. Um, and they're not necessarily tied to us. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Lane Lee uh, from Champ Clinics in opposition. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, other persons to testify on this measure? Zhu uh, Zhu Xiong uh, from CARES Community Art Recreation Education Services on Zoom. Okay. Aisha Esker, uh, individual in opposition. Um, good afternoon. My name is Aisha Esker. I'm the manager at Champ Inc. And um, I just wanted to say a couple of things. I'll be speaking on uh, behalf of the owner as well. So first of all, um, as the manager, I would be the person who would be getting any kind of complaint. And I haven't received an official complaint from the school or any neighboring business. Um, in addition to that, we do surveys. We've done surveys of the surrounding businesses. I've called the school personally, and I did not get any response from them. I did speak to someone um, in the administration office. So I know that uh, someone from the um, school did submit testimony at an earlier date. I don't know if they submitted for this um, particular, but if you look at their testimony, they're giving generalizations, um, saying that certain people are rowdy or something like that, but they are not isolating that these are our clients. Um, this is a community that has a lot of homeless people. If you go to the Poly Safeway, if you go to Poly Longs, you'll see a lot of people who are in a, you know, condition for whatever reason. It doesn't mean that there are clients though, so there's an assumption being made by the school or you know whoever is pushing this bill that the people who are maybe being rowdy in the area have some association with us. All of our clients have to go through a procedure to get into our MAT program. They need federally approved ID, they need insurance, they need all kinds of um, identifications in order to get into our program. And then once they're in, uh, they're monitored by our security guard. Our security guard monitors the periphery of the clinic. They, he monitors our clients. I guarantee that none of our clients are uh, creating any kind of havoc because they're being monitored. Um, if something is happening after hours, you know, that's beyond our scope. So I just wanted to be clear about that. And then um, in addition to that, so the owner has, you know, he's, he finds this bill, the amendments to the bill kind of strange. Because what it's asking is 
My that, apologies. Uh, okay. Two minutes. Yeah. Can you I'm just going to quickly yeah. say this: that um, within three years they want us to move, but we haven't had any sort of discussion or a committee. It's like, you know, a classic case of shoot and then aim. It's like saying let's hang the person and then afterwards hold a trial to see if they're guilty or not. If this approach is taken. Um, you're going to cause damage to nearly 300 clients and the surrounding community. So, um, as other as other people said, we are protected by the ADA. I think this bill needs to be reviewed. I think it should be deferred and reviewed. And um, you know, at some point, we should have some sort of a discussion. That's the first step. That's where we want to be. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next to testify, we have Britt Nakamura. Uh, individual in opposition. Um, I'm Britt Nakamura. Good afternoon, uh, members of the panel. Thank you. Um, I was a client of Champ Clinic from its beginnings in 1992 until 2007. Um, I started out in Kapahulu and then um, dropped off for a while when they moved into town because I couldn't find them. Through my subsequent journey with addiction, I lost everything I owned. I lost my children, I lost my sanity, and I ended up living um, in a tunnel under the Nuanu, uh, the Kuakini Bridge on Nuanu Stream. That put me in proximity to the clinic again. And I was lucky that the clinic was down in the location it was at, so I was able to walk there and get back on the track towards regaining my life, regaining my sanity, and become a productive member of society, which I am today. I've been clean for 11 years now, since February 6, 2012. And Champ Clinic has been a big part of my life and a big part of my journey. Um, I now work with some of the people that I once um, associated with and did drugs with. And um, as somebody who is one of, those, one of the former members of that demographic, they're acutely aware of what they're doing in the community and they're very uncomfortable. People aren't just willy-nilly wanting to, to be doing drugs out in public or whatever. When you're homeless, the world is your, is your bathroom, your world is your bedroom, and it's your, and it's your front room. You know? And it's shameful, and it's, and it's depressing, and it's hard. You know? And I can speak for most of the people that I know at the clinic share the same view. They don't want to be doing what they're doing. They're at the clinic to get better to do better, to have a better life. And sometimes, yes, we fall short, but we keep going, and that's why we're in a program like that. That's why we go to a methadone program, because it's something that gives us structure and gives us um, guidelines, and that's what a lot of people you know, with substance abuse disorders need. My apologies here, two minutes is mm -hmm. up. Uh, please and so I, just, I, I would just like to say to, um, so think about the impacts that it would have on um, on the community if there were 300 people, about 300 people, who suddenly um, were unable to access this program, access this um, medication, access these um, these good guidelines and good guidance that they get. Um, that that would be very detrimental to these people who are on on the road to regaining their lives. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any other persons here to testify on this measure? Please go ahead. Brief. My name's Nick Cunniff. I'm a counselor at Champ Clinic. Um, you know, what this really is is um, a, a case of, as the others have said, a case of discrimination. You're trying to leverage a school and fix a problem that, you know, not even doesn't exist in the first place. We have a security guard posted every day throughout his entire shift, which sits on the side of the street of the school, to make sure that no one even goes over there. So, I mean, if you, you know, we were forced to move, do you really think that, you know, with that security guard gone, do you think that the drugs and uh, degeneration in the neighborhood are really going to go away? Um, our location is essential to our success. Um, proximity to local hospitals, um, legal aid, of, um, legal aid um, uh, and other services around there, I mean, or services that our clients depend upon. Um, it's just really a shame that we're being treated like we're a problem when we are the solution. And I find it insulting that we're even having to come here again and defend it. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other persons here to testify on this measure? Seeing none, members, we have written testimony with comments from the Department of Law Enforcement in opposition from the Ho'o Pono Na Mea Ola 
uh, two other individuals from CHAMP clinics in opposition, uh, two individuals from K K Liko Lani Middle School in support, one individual from K A Liko Middle School in opposition, and 15 other individuals in opposition and two individuals with comments. Members, are there questions? Please go ahead. Um, for DOE, please. Deputy Superintendent, um, have there any been any documented cases at the middle school or any other schools about uh, methadone clinics? Um, good question. Thank you. I, I can't answer that right now, but I'm happy to talk to the principal and get that information to you. Okay. Thank you. Um, I have another question, but this one's mostly for Department of Health. Is there anyone from Department of Health here? Or maybe Public Safety can answer this. Um, based on how the bill's written, would this affect mobile clinics? So potentially. So um, the, the bill uses a term called substance use disorder treatment clinics. Um, now, it's, there, there are, I'm aware of um, some legislation uh, or uh, potential proposals that would allow these potential methadone clinics to go out into the, the community in a mobile effort to get it out into the community and make it more accessible. So potentially it could, depending on how we may have to license um, those, the mobile effort. So uh, it's difficult right now for me to say, but potentially it could also because the term substance use disorder services in this proposal is not defined. And so it could mean a very broad um, uh, number of things, which one of the other testifiers pointed out. Okay, thank you. No further questions. Go ahead. This question is for the Department of Education. Thank you for coming. Yes, um, I'll share a perspective and then ask a question. Um, growing up, my mom, when we would drive by uh, people in trouble, she'd say, stay in school, son. Do you think that this clinic being in close proximity to the school could actually you know, help the mental health crisis by encouraging students to make decisions that would um, be best for them by seeing the clinic nearby? You, you ask a very tough question. Uh, because each student <coughs> obviously would react in a different way. Um, whether some would have uh, acceptance, some might have trauma, it depends on the occurrence itself, right? If you're talking generalities of a building across the street and individuals there and uh, doing different things, uh, um, just if, if, if a student didn't know what was going on, they probably wouldn't bother them. But if they did, that might have some uh, impact. Uh, but it's, it's very difficult to say. Thank you. Any other questions? Actually, uh, I, I do have a question for DOE. Uh, so you noted in your testimony, of course, uh, K.A. Likolani Middle School mm -hmm. and kind of referenced CHAMP uh, Clinic. Uh, has the department in reviewing this bill looked at any other health uh, facilities uh, that qualify under the sun 50 feet? Uh, yes, we have. I uh, just mentioned those two specifically, but you know, the department's not against a clinic, obviously, and the department's certainly not out to uh, change people's lives and um, you know impact the services that are being provided. That is not the objective. The objective here is really to consider the proximity of, of a facility like this um, when there is a school. That, that, that's really what we're saying. Uh, if there's an opportunity to increase the radius um, to make it more safe, and again, it's just probabilities, right? We're talking about what if, um, but that's, that's the business that we're in. We're into the safety of our students. Uh, not to say that we're discounting any claims to individuals in, in, in the clinics. Uh, it's just that our perspective is to make sure that we're creating the, the best environment that we have for students. Okay, thank you. And, and one last thing in your testimony, you increased the distance from 750 feet to half a mile or 2,640 feet. Is that based on some best practices elsewhere or what is that based off of? That is based on vulnerability assessments that have been conducted in the past and best practices that we've learned over the, in the mainland. Um, there's no scientific number of uh, how many feet per se, but that is what we got from a vulnerability assessments. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, any other questions? 
Seeing none, we'll be moving on to HB 374 relating to alcohol. First to testify on this, is there anyone to testify on this measure? Okay, seeing none, members, we have written testimony in support from Maui Brewing Company, Honolulu Beer Works, Beer Lab Hawaii, Lanikai Brewing Company, Kauai Beer Company, and Mahalo Ale Works. Okay, moving on to HB 367 relating to Public Utilities Commission. First to testify on this measure, we have Dean Nishina, <coughs> Executive Director of DCCA, with comments. Aloha and good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee, Dean Nishina with the Division of Consumer Advocacy, which is in the Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs. You have a written testimony offering comments. We stand on that testimony, available for questions if you have any. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Leo Asuncion, uh, Chair of the Hawaii Public Utilities Commission, with comments. Uh, good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. I'm Daniel Park on behalf of the Public Utilities Commission. I stand on the commission's written testimony and am available for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Any other persons here to testify on this measure? Seeing none, members, we have uh, written testimony with comments from the Hawaii guests. Are there any questions? Seeing none, we'll be moving on to HB 368. This is relating to Public Utilities Commission. First to testify, we have Dean Nishina, Acting Executive Director of DCCA, with comments. Aloha again, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. We stand on our written testimony offering comments, available for questions if you have any. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Leo Sunshine, Chair of the Hawaii Public Utilities Commission, with comments. Aloha, Chair Nakashima, Vice Chair Sayama, and members of the committee. I am Clary Schaefer. I'm a utility analyst at the Public Utilities Commission. I stand on the commission's written testimony, and I'm available for questions from the committee. Thank you. Next, we have James Abraham, uh, Associate General Con uh, Counsel from the Hawaiian Electric, in support on Zoom. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee, James Abraham, testifying in support of House Bill 368 uh, on behalf of Hawaiian Electric. Hawaiian Electric supports this bill as it would help ensure that reporting requirements that are mandated by the PUC uh, continue to be useful and necessary. We do support the bill as written, but would also support the PUC's proposed amendments that were offered in their written testimony. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Next, we have Henry Curtis, Executive D Director, Life of Land, in opposition. On Zoom. Oh, I'm sorry, in person. <laughs> sorry. Henry Curtis, Executive Director of Life of the Land, Aloha Chair, Vice Chair, and Committee members. Just this morning, before coming to this meeting, I got HECO's key technical developments to enable distributed energy resources market growth. That is based on a PUC decision from eight years ago. In order to get that information out, the PUC would have to issue a decision each year identifying the report, saying how valuable it is, and um, justifying it. The PUC gets hundreds of reports from the utility, which helps them to better enforce and understand policies and procedures. To say that the PUC would have to look at each report each year and issue a decision would mean that you would have to fund someone to simply look at all the reports and waste time and waste paper and waste efficiency. This is a bill that should be killed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any other persons here to testify on this measure? Okay, seeing none, members, we have one written testimony in opposition from Ulupono Initiative. Members, are there any questions? Seeing none, we'll be moving on to HB 369. This is relating to the Public Utilities Commission. First to testify on this measure, we have Dean Nishina, Acting Executive Director from DCCA, with comments. Aloha again. Um, we stand on our written testimony, offering comments, available for questions if you have any. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Leo Sunshin, Chair of the Hawaii Public Utilities Commission, with comments. Uh, hello again. I stand again on the Commission's written testimony and uh, am available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Next, James Abraham, Associate General Counsel of the Hawaiian Electric, in support on Zoom. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. James Abraham, on behalf of Hawaiian Electric. Testifying in support of House Bill 369. You have our written testimony. I did want to clarify one aspect of this bill that relates to the sale of 
uh, fully depreciated assets. And that is when the utility sells fully depreciated assets, such as if they're scrap materials or for auctioning old vehicles, the amount re that we receive from the sale is recorded for accounting purposes as salvage. So there would not be a gain or a loss realized in disposing of these types of assets. Uh, accordingly, we do support this bill as it's currently drafted. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Are there any other persons here to testify on this measure? Okay, seeing none, members, are there any questions? Seeing none, we'll be moving on to HB 370. This is relating to the Public Utilities Commission. First to testify, we have Dean Nishina, Acting Executive Director of DCCA, with comments. Hello again, Dean Nishina with the Division of Consumer Advocacy. Um, you have our written testimony, which we stand on, but if I can just offer, you know, this, this bill as well as the others, I think um, from a consumer's perspective, you know, does put more strain on our office to find the benefits for our customers, especially on this particular measure, because some of these transfer of control um, can result in benefits to customers. For instance, in the recent uh, Hawaii gas transaction, we were able to secure $7 million worth of customer appreciation credits for the companies. So again, if, if the time available for our office to pursue these benefits is restricted, we may not be able to have the same results. Um, if you have any questions, I'm available. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Leo Asuncion, Chair of the Hawaii Public Utilities Commission, uh, with comments. Uh, hello again. Uh, once again, I stand on the Commission's written testimony and am available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Henry Curtis, Executive Director of Life of Land, in opposition. Aloha, Chair, Vice Chair, and Committee members. I want to take you back to four major merger decisions that have occurred. The first, is Hawaiian Telecom, which took 14 to 15 months to clear the PUC. The second was the acquisition of Hawaii Gas, which took 12 months. The HECO Next Era merger proceeding took 18 months, involved 28 interveners, involved county, state, and federal interveners. And KIUC may or may not have fallen fault to this if this bill had passed because yes the decision came out within the time limit that this bill suggested but then there was a a proposal to modify the decision which is not clear from this bill whether that would also fall within the time limit but this bill would have curtailed the Hawaiian Telecom the next era and the Hawaii gas merger proceedings very very important decisions on mergers they need the time to um, adequately review and to protect consumers. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other persons here to testify on this measure? Seeing none, members, any questions? Just go ahead. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Um, we have one more testifier. Uh, we have John Suki from Hawaiian Telecom in support. Aloha, Chair, Vice Chair, and members. Janine Suki, once again with Hawaiian Telecom. Um, we stand in support of this bill and are available for any questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, Rep. Here, please go ahead. This question is for Henry Curtis. Thank you for um, sharing your perspective. Um, could these mergers have happened within a shorter time frame? Pointing out that Next Era was not a merger, so it was a rejection of a merger. Could they have taken um, in a shorter amount of time. Um, I don't think they should have taken a shorter amount of time if you consider both the due process of all the parties and making sure that consumers get the maximum benefit from the process. If you wanted to simply say that mergers should be considered uh, and to eliminate any possible consumer gain, and to eliminate any um, intervener due process, then they could move faster. Thank you. Okay, members, are there any other questions? If seeing none, we'll be taking a short recess for decision making. Recess.
Hey, we're convening the Committee on Consumer Protection and Commerce uh, for decision making on the February 28th, uh, 2 p.m. agenda. First, uh, House Bill 797 uh, related to occupational uh, licensure. Um, Chair's recommendation is that we, um, on page 22, line 8, remove renewal um, from the uh, 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 deadline. Also, are there technical amendments for clarity, consistency, and style? Members, questions or comments? Okay, seeing none, Vice Chair as amended. Voting on HB 797, Chair's recommendation is to pass those amendments. Chair, Vice Chair, vote aye. Representative Amato? Aye. Representative Bilotti? Excused. Representative Hasham? Excused. Representative Hussey Berder? Aye. Representative Gates? Excused. Representative Lowen? Aye. Representative Onishi? Reservation. Representative Tam? Aye. Representative Purek? Aye. Thank you, Chair. Your recommendation is adopted. Okay. Thank you. Uh, House Bill 846 relating to teachers. Uh, you know, HST noting the testimony that another state has yet joined the compact and opines the cost for membership that has not yet been identified as such. I think we can wait and see if there is wider adoption from other states um, and what it will cost before being the first to jump into the compact. So I recommend deferral on this. Uh, <laughs> next, on House Bill 1074, related to the Executive Office on Aging. Uh, recommendation is technical amendments need for clarity, consistency, and style. Members, questions or comments? Seeing none, Vice Chair as amended. Voting on HB 1074, Chair's recommendation is to pass with amendments. Uh, noting the excuse absences of Representative Bilotti and Representative Gates and the presence of Representative Hasham, any members voting with reservations? Any members voting no? Thank you, Chair. Your recommendation is adopted. Thank you very much. On uh, House Bill 371, House Draft 1, relating to telecommunications and cable industry information reporting, uh, Chair's recommendation is that we use uh, HMSO amendments and other technical amendments needed for clarity, consistency, and style. Members, questions or comments? Seeing none, Vice Chair as amended. Voting on HB 371 HD1, Chair's recommendation is to pass with amendments. Uh, noting the excuse absences of Representatives Bilotti and Gates for the rest of this hearing. Uh, any members voting with reservations? Any members, re uh, any members voting with no? Uh, voting no? Thank you, Chair. Your recommendation is adopted. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, House Bill 371, House Draft 1, related to telecommunications. Oh, I'm sorry. House Bill 1074, related to the Executive Office on Aging. 1027. Oh. House Bill 1027 related to the Money Transmitters Modernization Act. Um, recommendation is that we um, change the definitions in the bill to be consistent with the Uniform Money uh, Transmission Modernization Act definitions for money. Also, technical amendments need for clarity, consistency, and style. Members, any questions or comments? Seeing none, Vice Chair as amended. Voting on HB 1027 HT 1, Chair's recommendation is to pass with amendments. Any members voting no? Any members voting with reservations? Thank you, Chair. Your recommendation is adopted. Thank you very much. House Bill 259, related to consumer protection. Um, Chair's recommendation is that we defect date this to June 30, 2000. Members, questions or comments? Seeing none, Vice Chair as amended. Voting on HB 259, uh, Chair's recommendation is to pass with amendments. Any members voting no? Any members voting with reservations? Thank you, reservations. Chair. Oh, reservations for Representative Onishi. Any mem other members voting with reservations? 
Thank you, Chair. Your recommendation is adopted. Thank you very much. Um, House Bill 1340, House Draft 1, related to uh, mental health. Uh, Chair's recommendation is that we uh, adopt DOH, DOH's amendments and other technical amendments need for clarity, consistency, and style. Members, any questions or comments? A brief comment. Um, well, I'd like to thank the introducers of this bill. Um, the health department mentioned that the private sector could address this issue. Um, so for those reasons, uh, with the hopes that the government can decrease, I'm voting no. Okay, thank you very much. Any other comments, questions? Seeing none, Vice Chair, as amended. Voting on HB 1340 HD, one chair's recommendation is to pass with amendments. Knowing the no vote from Representative Purick, any other members voting no? Any other members, any other members voting with reservations? Thank you, Chair. Your recommendation is adopted. Thank you very much. Uh, House Bill 714, House Draft 1, related to mooring lines. Uh, I will note that the bill does contain, already contain the uh, uh, effective, effective date. It's a work in progress. Uh, Chair's recommendation is to pass it out as is. Members, questions or comments? Well, I'd like to thank the introducers of this bill um, and protecting Hawaii jobs and helping the economy stay in Hawaii. I think an open market would lead Hawaii to be more competitive, to compete against the mainland so that the, the best service provider would get the, the contract or the job. So I'll be voting no. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions, comments? Seeing none, Vice Chair. Uh, as Oh, I'm sorry, right, but there must be very Sorry, I don't need to make a comment. Just reservations for me, please. Okay, reservations, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, Vice Chair. Voting on HB 714 HD, one chair's rec recommendation is to pass as is, noting the no vote from Representative Purick. Any other members voting no? Any other members uh, noting the uh, reservations vote from Representative Hussey Burdick? Any members voting with voting with reservations? With reservations. Reservations from Representative Amato. Any other members voting with reservations? Thank you, Chair. Your recommendation is adopted. <coughs> Thank you very much. House Bill 575, House Draft 1, um, for, uh, because of the um, constitutional arguments uh, being made by the Attorney General will defer this measure. Uh, House Bill 704, House Draft 1, related to motor vehicle registration. Chair's recommendations to be passed this as is. Members, questions or comments? Seeing none, Vice Chair, as is. Voting on HB 704 HD 1, Chair's recommendation is to pass as is. Any members voting no? Any members voting with reservations? Thank you, Chair. Your recommendation is adopted. <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, House Bill 378, House Draft 1, related to controlled substances. Um, okay. Chair's recommendation is that we uh, strike Section 1. Um, we delete page 7 lines. 18 to page 8, line 2. Um, amend page 9 to read any other factor relevant and consistent with the public health and safety, including but not limited to the prevention of activities within the applicant's area that are potentially injurious to the health, safety, and welfare of the public and neighborhood and uh, delete section five, page 11, line 19, to page 16, uh, page 16, line 16, and renumber the um, paragraphs accordingly, also deleting all references to the 750 feet. Members, any questions or comments? Oh, yes. Um, I think the proximity of the clinic to the school may uh, serve as a deterrent for doing um, illegal drugs. So I think the, um, the separation um, is unstantiated without testimony of children's being harmed or endangered. So for those reasons, I'll be voting no. Um, we are not changing um, 
the we're not requiring the relocation of the clinic. Okay. What okay. would the what would the bill do? A, any other so questions or comments? Okay. Seeing none, vice chair as amended. Uh, voting on HB 378 HD 1, Chair's recommendation is to pass with amendments. Any members voting no? No vote for Representative Amato. Uh, any other members voting no? Any other me any members voting with reservations? Reservations for Representative Tam. Uh, Representative Purick, was no, no vote? No. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Chair. Your recommendation is adopted. Okay, thank you very much. On House Bill 374, our uh, recommendation of the chair is to defect dated June 30, 3000. Members, any questions or comments? Seeing none, Vice Chair as amended. Voting on HB 374, Chair's recommendation is to pass with amendments. Any members voting no? Any members voting with reservations? Thank you, Chair. Your recommendation is adopted. Okay, members, the uh, Next four bills are works in progress. Uh, House Bill 367 recommendation is to defect date it June 30, 3000 and move it without, uh, as amended. Members, questions or comments? Seeing none, Vice Chair as amended. Voting on HB 367, Chair's recommendation is to pass with amendments. Any members voting no? Any members voting with reservations? Thank you, Chair. Your recommendation is adopted. Thank you very much. House Bill 368, relating to the Public Utilities Commission, uh, recommendations to defect data June 30, 3000. Members, any questions or comments? Seeing none, Vice Chair as amended. Voting on HB 368, Chair's recommendation is to pass with amendments. Any members voting no? Any members voting with reservations? Reservations. Reservations for Representative Hussey Burdick. Any other members voting with reservations? Thank you, Chair. Your recommendation is adopted. Thank you very much. House Bill 369, related to the Public Utilities Commission, uh, recommendation defect date, June 30, 3000. Members, questions or comments? Seeing none, Vice Chair as amended. Voting on HB 369, Chair's recommendation is to pass with amendments. Any members voting no? Any members voting with, reserva with reservations? Thank you, Chair. Your recommendation is adopted. Thank you very much. House Bill 370 related to the Public Utilities Commission. Chair's recommendation defect dated June 30, 3000. Members, questions or comments? Seeing none, Vice Chair as amended. Voting on HB 370, Chair's recommendation is to pass with amendments. Are any members voting no? Any members voting with reservations? Re Reservation. Reservations from Representative Hussey Burdick. Any other members voting with reservations? I'll just go reservations for the heck of it. Reservations. With, for Representative Lowen. Any other members voting with reservations? Thank you, Chair. Your recommendation is adopted. Thank you very much. And uh, finally, uh, from uh, the February 22nd, uh, 2023 uh, hearing at 2 o'clock, um, House Bill 640 uh, relating to insurance. Um, Chair's recommendation is that uh, um, you know, during the first hearing on House Bill 640, uh, concerns were raised over the maintenance of peer-to-peer -peer car sharing vehicles, uh, despite uh, the fact that it was pointed out that the same statutory requirement for maintenance applied to both rental and peer car vehicles. We want to make certain that we uh, address any concerns. We are going to amend uh, House Bill 640 with a House Draft 1 that incorporates previous amendments suggested by Turo in the past. The amendment will provide for a coverage of $750,000 for vehicles to address maintenance concerns raised by the Hawaii Association for Justice, while also addressing issues from the peer-to-peer -peer car industry about insurance coverage for drivers. <coughs> Uh, second, on in section two on page four, the uh, bill is uh, going to be amended to read uh, Act 56, comma, Session Laws of Hawaii, 
2022 is amended by adding section five to read as follows. Uh, this act shall take effect on January 1st, 2023. Members, any questions or comments? Seeing none, Vice Chair as amended. Going on to HB 640, Chair's recommendation is to pass with amendments. Any members voting no? Uh, resuming with the vote, mem uh, members, uh, any members voting no? Any members voting with reservations? With reservations. Where are reservations? Representative Amato, any other members voting with reservations? Thank you, Chair. Your recommendation is adopted. Okay, thank you very, very much. We are adjourned.